Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we had we had a small small drama, but uh, thank goodness uh, Katie managed to get her car broke down on the way here. But um, she's left it on the side of the road. She grabbed a taxi, and she's here. Presentations because you get to meet different people that surprisingly like listening to what we, we like talking about, and we also get to catch up with our research friends. And coincidentally, we didn't try for this to be all females. These are just the people that are working in sharks in the Western Cape, which is kind of cool. <laughs> okay, so vulnerable. Oh, let me just see. Okay, yep. Yeah, so here you can see a picture out of Hansbar. This used to be the peak of the shark fishery in South Africa for, geez, from like. Um, peaks in the 1930s and you don't see these animals anymore. Um, but I decided instead of going through every shark that's under threat, that instead I will tell you from my perspective what we have to do to figure out which animals are under threat and how, what, what we can do about it. So sharks are an icon, there's a reason you're all here, they're very sexy and there really has been a change in perception over the last hundred years. Firstly they were vilified as these monsters and now we're vilified as the monsters. Um, and it's, it, to me, it's amazing um, that we've come so far. And this was very apparent last week when <laughs> we had this fool go swim with the white shark. And what's interesting to me is that 20 years ago, it would have been, the story would have been brave blonde swims with white sharks. 10 years after that, it would have been, look, sharks are dangerous. And now it's like, why is that blonde bimbo? harassing that potentially pregnant shock. And to me, this just shows how far we've come. And these are some of the quotes flying around and it's getting a bit heated and if you want to have a good laugh, these are kind of, these are Twitter searches. I mean, this is a Twitter search worth doing. Um, and so for me, yes, they're an icon, but it became very clear to me in my early career that they are a source of food and very many of our Fishing communities actually rely on these for to eat, they feed their families, um, and we have a very big 
um, fillet industry in South Africa where the, the sharks are caught. Um, these are actually from 2007. This is, the, uh, this is what's left over, and then these are the l nice shark fillets, and it, it's a, it's, it is a fairly well man managed fishery, and overall in South Africa, our fisheries are fa our shark fisheries are fairly well, and I'm talking comparatively to global fisheries. Obviously, there's always room for improvement. So, major threats fishing shark, facing sharks. I'm going to focus on the top bits because I'm not really the <laughs> environmental changes and habitat degradation is not something that is directly something that I deal with. So I thought that I would leave that to better people to discuss. But for the most part, the biggest threat of sharks is targeted fishing. But even bigger than that is the bycatch and the unmanaged managed fisheries. And we're talking many countries that don't submit any data to any um, any fishing organisation. And you know, from Mozambique up, it's really you're not sure what comes out there. And if you if you Google for those catches, you'll see large areas where nothing is reported. So here you can see, that's what a hammerhead looks like. That's what a hammerhead looks like when it's head off. It's a problem because you would never guess that's a <laughs> And that's literally the first shark I discovered when I was doing my masters, and it took me weeks to figure it out. Um, we have a, a common thresher over here, and these are mako fins. Okay. So the role of a fishery scientist in South Af in, at DAF is to, we got to balance conservation and, and utilization. So we, firstly, we, we make sure that the fisheries are sustainable. But I'm going to tell you today why that is a problem. It is difficult, and it's time and data intensive. And for sharks, the data is never very good. And this, and this, is, a gen this is a general comment for all shark fisheries. Um, but we have other toolbox, two tools in our toolbox. Um, if we consider them as food sources, we can go the ethical and the safe route as well, and I'll tell you about those later. So basically, John Shepard has this great quote, and this explains everything that is why fisheries management is so hard. He says, managing fisheries is hard. It's like managing a forest in which the trees are invisible and they keep moving around. And that's exactly what we face when we try and assess these stocks. Here's my colleague eating a silky shark sandwich. <laughs> It was a mortality on the line, and sometimes researchers have to have fun as well. <laughs> it was sampled for scientific purposes. Okay, so there is a myth of sus unsustainable shark fisheries. I'm sorry, can you please use this mic? Really great. Sorry about that. Hello? Okay, that's better. Okay, so there is the sentence that the shark biology, we all like to say, and it's sometimes shorthand, and it, and it helps us when it comes to management, but we like to say that sharks are sustainable because they're life history, and that's not necessarily true, because hypothetically all chondrichthians can be harvested sustainably when they match with appropriate gear and suitable managed interventions. But this also depends on the life history and distribution, some are more suited than others. So here we have, on this extreme, we have a blue shark, very fecund, very abundant, and we have a cow shark over here. And this, was, this is very apparent when you look at the southern uh, shark fishery of Australia, where they put some restrictions on their gummy shark, which is related to our smooth hunt. And basically, they've got very high mortality when they get to about 50% of their age. And so they capped the fishing so that the larger, more fecund, animal, fecund animals were able to escape. And this proved to be a very good, um, very good management intervention. Um, I'm just, so the, I'm setting the stage here, which I'll probably break down later, but theoretically this is possible. And now we have to get the data where we can get there. Okay, so how can chondrichthys be managed sustainably? So first thing is a species-based research. And um, the research into their life history. So how fast do they grow? How old do they get? How many pups do they have? When do they start breeding? This is, this is important information that we need to know. Um, taxonomy is important. Katie is probably going to tell you about that later again, but when we're, catching, when, when we're discovering sharks that are already extinct, that's not a good situation. Um, then fisheries is a big part of it. We need to monitor, monitor our fisheries, need to understand which fisheries are catching which species, and bycatch fisheries are especially important to figure out because when you have these large fisheries that cross, that catch about 100 species, um, sometimes the, the minor catch are not recorded. Um, 
then we, this data that we need to collect needs to be long term because for some of these animals they get 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years old and for us to be able to look at the impact on their, um, so their population we need to actually be able to look at that kind of time frame of data. Then fishery independent data is really good because we all know that fishermen lie. Um, Researchers sometimes do, but <laughs> mostly just the fishermen. So we have observer data sets where we have an external agency that come and have a look at a subset of the fishermen, what they're catching, what they say we're catching, and between the two we can actually look. And we need to validate the fishery. And just to give you an example, so we, I'm going to be talking you, to you through some stock assessments now, um, but basically you need to just understand that we can't use catch data to do any sorts of assessment. For example, if you look at five fishermen, um, if you look at over five years, one fisherman one year catches 10 sharks, and the next year, two fishermen catch 10 sharks, and the third year, three fishermen catch 10 years. If you look at the catch, it looks like the catches are stable. But when you, when you divide the number of fish caught, divided by the number of people, how hard it was to catch those animals, then you can get some sort of trend, exactly. And that is the one trend that we use a lot when, as an input for our models. And if it could be anything, it could be the number of hours fish, number of hooks, number of boat days, and this depends on what fisheries you deal with. So here you can see a little St. Joseph sharks, and that is the poor beagle shark, and this is literally the first one I've ever seen in South Africa, so that's very cool. Okay, so what do I, why is biology important? So I've given you two examples here. This one is, is something that is very, very, very good at handling fishing pressure. And we have a smooth pound, which is about modern. I could extend this to something like a white shark and we'd get more extreme. But I thought this would give you a nice example. So these are the kind of characteristics here that are direct inputs into models. So the stock assessment models we use need this information to actually make it work. So if you remember the catch series goes down, but we need to know that how long these animals start, uh, when they start breeding, how long they live, and that information helps us to balance the catch data a little bit and give us an answer about what the stock is doing. So if you look at the blue sharks, they're fast growing, they start maturing at five years. Here you have an animal that starts maturing at 10 years. Um, with reproduction, we have a distinct sub-adult phase, so when they get to about five years, they, have, they start having pups early, and then later they increase, the bigger they get. With smooth hounds, they only reproduce at 10, and they, the bigger they get, the more pups they have. Um, and as you can see, when they get to the last phase, blue sharks have quite a few pups versus. So if you look at these two, you'd imagine that this one can sustain fisheries pressure a lot better. And the kind of management here, um, let me get to the management in the next slide. Okay, so, and this kind of information is not that stuff that we put directly into stock assessment. This is information that give us kind of a, like extra management measures. So things like area closures and seasonal closures. So reproduction, we know that blue sharks have nursery grounds off Cape Point in those trans transition filament zone. Um, and this, for example, could be used as a closed area. We know which, what time of year it happens, and if we have um, exact environmental data, we can kind of pretty much predict where those areas are going to be um, for the year. For smooth hounds, they have nursery areas in soft sediment bays, um, and they're resident in those bays. And we know from the genetics that there's potential sharing of stuff with neighboring countries, but it's not quite as... as um, direct as for the blue shock. So the kind of management advice for smooth hounds, we can go, okay, they occur in these areas, there are MPAs in this area, definitely don't let the fishermen in there. Um, or close off fishing um, in the inshore areas, because then we know the smooth hounds back there. They, we know that they breed in, in summer, we know which areas, so you can close those areas only in summer. Um, for blue sharks, it gets a little bit more difficult. When it comes to movement, we're talking about something that's capable of moving the entire ocean. And this is just a subset of pack data from the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and as you can see, they move freely across the ocean. And here is where the Indian Ocean, and oh my, I'm shaking there a bit, but it's over there at 20 degree, is, is a barrier. And every year I have to subtract the data out and send it to different organizations. And we have just our little sharks that just frequently cross. No one told them where the boundary is. I think we should, we should get to that. But 
And the blue shark genetics is showing something similar. It's showing potentially it, it's hinting at a global population, and the impacts of that is quite quite large. And I can show you now. So here's the map of all the tuna RFMOs and how they've neatly divided the ocean amongst themselves. Um, here you can see um, South Africa, and our blue sharks are just crossing. And for that matter, the swordfish. Shall we maybe explain what an RFMO? Yes, thank you. So. Um, RFMO is, sorry, I'm using so much. Thank you for that, Alison. Um, okay, so it's a regional fisheries management organization. For these very, very expensive type products, especially tuna, you have these big global organizations that have meetings every year, and they have scientists and politicians and um, kind of WWF type organizations that meet up every year to discuss the issues and they divide the corpus up amongst themselves and each little unit here does their own little stock assessment on their own animals without out really considering the data from the neighboring ocean. Now for us, um, the, the, I mean this is, we shouldn't, we, we don't really have to worry about this side. When it comes to the Indian Ocean, the, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, and the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, we definitely have movement, not of blue sharks only, swordfish, yellowfin tuna, they're all moving across this line. And in fact, we looked at mako shark data and we pulled out the, link, the, the size information between, between like 10 years and you can see <laughs> the actual data, it suddenly looks like um, all the big sharks have been caught out in the Indian Ocean and there was an absolute panic. And then we just showed them how these animals were just year by year moving backwards and forwards across this line. Um, so this is something that implicates management because they cannot be managed if we don't know how many stocks there are. And if we know how many stocks there are, the, the, sh the sharing of the data and the stock assessment should become a priority. So based on a little bit of the biology, which one would you guys guess is white shock? So at the top here, you have an abundance index. So this would be the catch data, and this would be our model fit, which probably kind of I'm going to talk a lot of shorthand here because this is a model that only three people in the world understand and I'm definitely not one of them. So this gives you the trend output. So we've got catches from 1980 to 2010. We've got the same on this side, but the, the range is a little bit longer. We've got a declining trend over there with a little bit of peak. So this is something I'm going to introduce you later. Basically, this is a very special model called JARA, which is used for redless assessment, and this is the green light, the traffic light system. So you can see if it's in the green, it's the least concern. If it's in the yellow, it's vulnerable. If it's in the orange, it's endangered, and on this side. So here we can see that there's most evidence that this animal is least concern. So it's not a threat, and you can see the line is straight. On this side, the trend is a little bit scarier. If you gnaw that bump in the middle there, it goes straight down. Um, and here you can see all the evidence here sitting in an endangered with a probability of 56%. Any guesses which one the watch? And this is the Indian Ocean white shark. That's the white shark. So, <laughs> so when it comes to looking at these abundances over this period for the Indian Ocean, there's been very little change and they have been classed, well, the models have put them out as being least concerned. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of weighing in that'll go afterwards to decide what the ICN is going to decide what the status is, but this is just, just looking at the pure data. On this side, we have the MAKO, um, the North Atlantic MAKO. Um, just, just as a side note, um, overall white sharks are not doing so well because the North Atlantic stock is not in the green at all. Um, so it's important to understand the fisheries and how this has changed over time. Um, so chondrichthians, sharks, skates, and rays are caught over 10 to 12 different South African fisheries, depending on which ones you refer to fisheries, and the KZM Bay, the protection fishery. Um, it's about 100 species from 204 estimated species occurring in southern Africa. So that's the, why the numbers are so different between myself and Alison. Um, she was referring to South Africa. So the first kind of overview paper was in 1996 with CRISA, and basically they estimated 2,500 tons caught in, over that period. The recent reported catch is kind of similar, but the composition of the catches have changed quite a bit. 
So how do we manage sharks in South Africa? So our large pelagic long, uh, long line fishery is actually our flagship, the one that we're most proud of because we are far ahead of any other, other countries in terms of shark management. Um, all the Cites Phoenix 2 species are, are delisted in South Africa. You cannot catch them commercially. Um, for example, the oceanic white tip, the threshers, the mobile rays, the hammerhead sharks. We have the fins naturally attached rule, so the fishermen can't go out there and cut the fins off. The product needs to be landed with the fins attached to the body, which makes things so much easier for us. Um, we, we currently manage the fishery with the um, precautionary upper catch limit of 2,000 tons. So once this is reached, the entire fishery closes. Um, and we also don't allow white races, which is the way that they target sharks. So this is a pelagic long line. Basically, you get these floats that lift the, and, and they fish in about 1,000 uh, meters of water, and it just keeps the line at about 20 meters to 30 meters, depending on what they want to catch. Um, and then they use glow sticks and all sorts of bait to target the fish, the species they are after. Then we have the demersal shark line, long line fishery. Um, so no sighted species are allowed. We've also stopped them from catching cow sharks. Um, beach sand fishery, um, no retention of sharks and rays, except for the beach sand fisheries in False Bay. The top here, this is a demersal shark long line. You can see it's the same as the pelagic one, but it's, it's kind of weighted on the bottom, so it targets a different species. We've got a seine net over here and a gill net over here. Um, Lastly, we have some rec recreational limits, which is one individual sh species for each shark per day may be retained except for that group. Okay, so this is a very scary plot. This is the model that only three people in the world understand, but it's the traffic light system. So we have our soupfin shark um, and our smooth hound shark. Soupfin shark is the one that used to be the pr predominant catch in um, Hans Bay, which is crashed they used to catch 3,000 tons in the 1930s, and that's dropped to less than 100 tons. They can't catch them in those amounts anymore, um, and there's no doubt that they've been completely overfished. And um, Smooth Island is doing slightly better, and it, this has been a recent decline. And um, so the problem with us only getting to here now is that these mod this fancy model that actually looks at the data, that puts it in, in like a format that we can use, didn't exist more than three years ago. So we're kind of bound to the m methods that's available. And this is, in fact, one of the first countries where we've used this model. So we're now in a situation to take this um, preliminary s assessment and roll it out to the fisheries. Um, so what else? OK, yes. Then we have a, a different model that looks at, um, so most of you have heard of the Africana surveys. So we have a research troll survey that goes out twice a year, and they have since the early 80s. Um, and they have special grids that they, hit, that they go and fish every year. Um, and they've been collecting all the data since that time. And we've been able to get the data out of, of, of these historical databases. So we've um, run the model to give us a trend so this would be for um, the biscuit skate, which is something that there's no country in the world that's been able to assess these kinds of species. Um, and this model's actually been, at, we've run it on 22 species of, sh of chondrichthys for South Africa. And so you can see these are the two different s series. The model's gonna, so those are the, all the catch data, the abundance data. We've got the model that runs the trend, and you can see it's a decreasing trend over here. Um, and then it, what it does is it looks at the com how confident it is in that data, and it, it projects forward because, anyway, the lifespan of the animal. So um, depending on how long the animal grows, it projects forward, and then it gives you a percentage uh, decrease. So the ICN works on, one of the principles they work on is they look at the decline from the first period to the end, and the percentage of decline gives you the probability of it falling into one of these categories. Again. Only three people in the world understand <laughs> So the important thing is just to look at the direction of that trend over time and then look at the probabilities here, and here you see it falls into least concern. And this data has quite a high spatial kind of uh, resolution around the country, so this is fairly, we're fairly certain about this. Um, here we have the St. Joseph, totally different animal, is, starts, growing, it starts breeding very young, and as you can see, We've got the catch trends over here. The model pushes the data up, even projecting forward. 
absolutely fine and it's 100% that this animal is the least concerned. So this is a model that we've been using to kind of inform ISCN because no country has data about sharks and it's generally a bunch of scientists sitting around a room and discussing what they kind of think is happening based on how many PT saw in 1996 versus how many when Paul is seeing now and it doesn't work. Um, and without this kind of modeling, we are actually hamstrung. And um, we're at a wonderful stage now where these very clever people are developing these models that we can do this kind of stuff. And it's nice to be at the forefront of something for once. <laughs> so here you can see 21 species, and we've got another nine over there, um, of all the shark skates and rays in South Africa. Again, this is just what the models predicted. As you can see, most of them in the green. Um, we've got a few that are in the red, endangered listed, and this has got nothing to do with fisheries. So some of these we've predicted is probably related. So it'd be some of these cat sharks, which is definitely an environmental threat because we've had some weird movement of upwelling shell. Anyway, there's been very strange movement of sharks around the country, um, and we predict that this has got nothing to do with fisheries. But for the most part, this is... Quite, this is a, a good start for us to be able to manage our shark fisheries. Okay, so how do we use this assessment? So I've given you a lot of information, and what I'm trying to do, <laughs> what I'm trying to get to, to how difficult it is to actually use this information, and why it's so important that we collect all this different. So we start off with assessment, and my friend Henning does a lot of work to produce all this wonderful code, and that goes to the scientific working group where they either endorse it or they don't endorse it. Then it goes for, as a scientific recommendation for the fishery. It's recommend, recommended to resource management via the minister, and then it's either endorsed or it's not endorsed, in which case it goes back to the slope. And for the most part, we're sitting in this cycle where things are not endorsed and we keep on having to circle. And for, for the most part, it takes about 15 minutes, I mean 15 years for these recommendations to make it through the system. Um, it is very difficult and we're constantly fighting. I've had shark rec um, recommendations that have been sitting there for eight years and we just can't just get set them through. And there's, there's no reason, there doesn't seem to be any reason why they're not being passed. So RFM, when it gets to an RFMO level, the international level, it's even more complicated because we have this Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, we've got the Atlantic, we've got the CCSPT and they only care about bluefin, so that's fine. We've got the FAO, which we send data to, and then all of this data goes to DEER, and DEER does with, deals with a bunch of these things, which goes back to DAF. And then there's a lot of backwards and forwards between the two, two departments. So again, the, all these recommendations based on the assessments has to go to all these processes. And then I'm going to take you to the international stuff with. So this is, would be a plot for one of the international um, assessments for blue sharks and you can see this one is least concern and this is not surprising based on the biology slides I gave you guys earlier they've insanely fecund and we've made simulations of the models where we fish them as hard as we can in the model and they just don't they just don't decline and it's, it's very strange um, but they're a very good fishery species and then we have the opposite which is hammerhead and as you can see, there is a 41% chance in this projected run that it is critically endangered. So, now I remember the slide that talks about what we do about assessment. Oh, that gets worse when it gets to RNFO, <laughs> on O level. We have an assessment that goes to the scientific committee, and you have a bunch of scientists sitting um, from different countries, and they are composed of scientists and politicians and they all have their national agenda and they get told before the meeting what they're supposed to vote for and what they need to push. And for something to actually pass to the commission, there needs to be a quorum, which means all the countries need to agree. And we're talking about countries as varied as the EU, the States and Japan. So um, there is very often there, especially with shark related plans, there is no action. It goes back and it goes backwards and forwards and we get nothing done. Anyway, if, if they do pass something, the commission formulates a conservation measure. This is adopted and there's new fisheries regulations and this is what we hope for. But with sharks not being the highest value at these fisheries level, um, and just, and this is not, this is not because, this kind of thing fails not because political will or people don't care or it's, Every country has their own agenda and it's based on what 
they're supposed to get for their fishery and um, the kind of quotas they're trying to get. So this is a very, very difficult process that um, kind of seems to fail a few sharks every now and then. So then we have things like the red list and CITES that step in, and currently this is super secret information, but uh, <laughs> so we're in the situation where makers, all the stock assessments have shown that they're not doing well, and they've been requesting the various tuna groups to protect them for years and years and years, and at the scientific groups, people have spoken about it and say, if you don't do anything about it, CITES will step in. Well, we're now in a situation where MAKO has been proposed, and this is one, I think this is a North Atlantic run, it's sitting at 56% endangered, where CITES now stepped in, and the proposals have now gone through. Um, December, we had species listed that came, and um, the proposals were submitted, and this is the situation where we now, where the expert panel has to look at these proposals and come up with a suggestion. And it's very likely um, that it's going to be passed, and like this, this is very, this kind of process could, is very concerning to something, maybe because on one level, I agree that the sharks need protection, and I like how CITES works for um, very, very um, endangered animals, but I'm concerned about the obligations and how we'll be able to object those. And you've, if, sorry. <laughs> so basically with the CITES monitors trade, so it's the international trade of endangered, that's the one. Um, so basically, um, they are, abalone's been listed, rhino's been listed, um, and there's a lot of debate whether it works. But so if something is Appendix 1 listed, they can't be traded at all, uh, legally, obviously. And uh, Appendix 2, they can be traded with very specific um, requirements. So there's a lot of paperwork that has to accompany. And as a country, we're obligated to do a lot of inspections and be able to kind of account for all these sharks. And on my side, sitting on the other end where I'm going to be dealing with this kind of data, this concerns me quite a bit. And there's quite a few countries here that I'm very concerned. Um, the, the, country that catch, the countries that catches the most makers is the EU bloc. And, um, Again, these, um, these meetings are very interesting because you think that you think you can kind of figure out what everyone's up to, but you can't um, because there's all sorts of agendas. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, um, but for once, we have these organizations that do step in and maybe if it just gets some sort of momentum going. I might be wrong. This might be an easy process and it might work and I can only hope because the, RFM, the regional fisheries management organizations are not stepping in. So I've given you all these assessment tools and how long it takes to get that stuff and the kind of research that we need to do. But we have these other tools in our toolbox that we use quite successfully. So in the National Plan of Action for Sharks, which is um, the document that basically guides how we're going to manage sharks, we've said that full utilization of product is important. So if the fins are going to be used, we want the fillets used, we want everything used. Um, We've got thinning le legislation now, um, bycatch, we want all bycatch used, um, and if there's areas where they catch a lot of bycatch, we want that taken out, because the, for us, ethical consideration is having, having the fishermen to ha have the most money for the kind of product they catch. Um, so this is the out potential outputs of this research. We have successfully managed to place com commercially valuable apex predators on the prohibited list. If you remember earlier, we took, um, cow sharks off the fishing list, and we used this. We, we said this is not a value, commercially valued product, and this is, so this is just saying, okay, fine, sharks are not cool, they are food, but in that case, here's an animal that people don't eat, why are you catching it? And this is how we've managed to actually um, collect this. And then, one of the things we're really considering now is looking at this imports of fins in, in South Africa because it's a very difficult thing for us to monitor um, because fin, fins come in and out and then they come back in again and they go somewhere else and it's impossible to actually get an idea. And our fishermen, um, you know, we've got a lot of restrictions on our fishermen and they're feeling a bit burdened by the fact that they've got all this stuff coming at them, but including the mako, I mean, so we have, sorry, let me, let me go back a step. So we've got these fishermen that have, our fishermen have agreed to all these permit conditions, and this was not something we had to tell them. They, they came and said, fine, we'll do it. But now they're facing this Mako CITES appendix kind of listing, and, and in their point of view, they, like, they say to us that 
You know, they've been restricted all along. Why are they suffering now? Because now they've got to do an extra set of permits. And you all know how difficult it is to deal with South African government documents. So, yeah, so this is something we have to look at. And then the best tool we have is, again, a shark is food. And there's certain types of sharks that you can't eat. And there's certain sizes of sharks that you can't eat either. So are they safe to consume? Some of them over a certain size have large kind of concentrations of cadmium, lead, um, mercury, and arsenic. Um, soup and shark, over 130, shouldn't eat it. Smooth on sharks, that's the one that hasn't picked up, but this is, anyway. And then most of the sharks that are exported exceed these um, concentrations. So what we've used this is that we have actually used this input to recommend a slot limit for demersal shark species. So basically, again, remembering the Australian example where they're only catching smaller sharks, this effectively does this, protect the larger morphicon sharks that have more pups. Um, and we can just say, you know, that the, these animals are being caught for food. So if it's over the size, they can't eat it or sell it anyway. Um, and a big problem we have in South Africa, places like Hans Bay, we have this opportunistic catching of large sharks that happen. And by putting this limit, we stop that kind of activity completely. Um, and again, placing commercially valuable. Things like a cow shark should never eat a cow shark. Trust me. <laughs> okay, and then the way forward, um, I really do believe that that the only way we can actually go forward in protecting these animals is that by considering them as, as an icon for some and a source of food for others. And only in embracing all of these different kind of characteristics of these animals is, is the only way forward. And then what can we do? What can you guys do? For starters, thank you for coming to this lecture series. It's always good to be informed. Um, but it's, it's great to be aware of these kind of, act, um, these kind of issues and um, making informed choices about your seafood. And I don't know if you know about the SASI list, but we have this great... Um, initiative, the SASI list, where they list shark, uh, fish and sharks into different categories, things you should eat in green, things that you should not eat in red, and these are the kind of, um, kind of things that you can look out for. And yeah, I can go on and on and on, but I'll <laughs> hand over to Katie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlene, for a really informative and interesting talk. Um, I agree, it's really great to hear about management of sharks, and we need to consider that they are food and they are going to continue to be fished. And um, I really have to give my hat off to Charlene. She's done probably, arguably, more for shark conservation than most people combined in this is that she's been working out at DAF. And that's what I really like about our group, and particularly the group of scientists researchers that have been presenting this week. Um, often you'll find conservationists and scientists at loggerheads and then the scientists and the fisheries managers at loggerheads. But I think we all work really well together trying to sort of manage um, all our different agendas and ways. And um, again, just sort of recognising that that's a good way forward. And great to see that sort of initiative happening here. So I'm just going to carry on a little bit following on from what I was talking about the other day um, and a little bit following on from what Charlene was um, talking to us about. So Charlene gave us a really great introduction to some of the fisheries species that are vulnerable and at risk of extinction here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about sort of how we make some of these assessments. Um, but not as technical, um, and then also uh, some of the other threats that are affecting some of the species here, and particularly focusing on my great love, the endemic species. <laughs> Um, so, in 2014, there was a global study done assessing the conservation status of sharks, and this received a ton of attention and media attention. And it was actually really good at drawing um, attention to the conservation of these animals and how many of them are th at threat. So globally, they say there's around 25%, so a quarter, of sharks are at risk of extinction. Um, on the flip side, we always say that figure, but on the flip side, it's also 75% aren't at risk of extinction. But it just helps us prioritise which sharks that we should be looking at and the different areas that we should be looking at to try and focus on. 
So one of the really interesting outputs that like, even really surprised the lead authors of this study is that it's not actually the sharks, it's the rays that are at greater risk of extinction. Um, so it, it's really brought some interesting um, attention to these species. So I mentioned the sawfish, those big funny looking animals with a chainsaw rostrum. Um, and then my, my other friends, the wedge fishes, the other flatfish that I'll be talking about in a minute. But I'm um, just highlighting that it's often the rays that are at greater risk of extin extinction than the sharks. So how do we see this? We've heard, how do we assess this? We've heard the terms endangered, critically endangered, and those terms being thrown around. But how do we assess it and what does it actually mean? So we use the um, uh, categories and criteria of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, so IUCN for short, um, Red List of Threatened Species. And what this is is a systematic tool, so no matter what we're assessing anywhere in the world, if we're assessing our, the status of our sharks here in South Africa, or the ones in Australia or America or wherever else in the world, we use exactly the same criteria. However, it's not just for sharks, it's for all the other animals you might be familiar with, so rhinos, elephants, giraffes, and even frogs in the Amazon, koalas in Australia, or coral reefs. So if you, it's really interesting, I nerd out at this website a lot, but it's really interesting to look at the comparison, not just within sharks, but you can compare it to other groups. So you see the sharks and rays down here, now at about 31 percent are at risk of extinction, and you can compare it to how many amphibians, mammals, so not even just at the shark level, but it also gives us a way to prioritise animals, um, for example, for funders and conservationists that we should be focusing our, focusing our research on. So I'm not going to go into much detail. I do have apologies crumpled because I had to throw them in the taxi at the last second. <laughs> but I do have two, uh, two sheets there if you want to actually have a look at the criteria and understand what it means. Um, it's actually quite an overly complicated 40-page manual to assess it, but there's a cheat sheet there that we go back to refer to. So what we do is look at these criteria, A to um, E, and what we try and assess is most sharks are either criteria A, most of them are actually criteria A, but we also have a few that are criteria B. So what we look at is trends over time, so population reduction. So we use models, the most informative models that we can get are from data like Charlene. I must say that Charlene and Duff provided the high, much higher quality data than anyone else within the region um, for the regional red list assessments. But what we have a look at is these trends over time. So again, as Charlene was saying, we can compare how many animals there are from 1980 to the present time. But what we also have to account for, and which is where we really need some research for sharks as well, is we have to factor in some of the life history traits, like it's based on um, generation length. And Believe it or not, I think there was, I think we've got, I mean, I think it was like 40 species we've got good age and growth data for in the world. Yeah. Which is terrifying. So we need to know what that means, is we need to know what age are they when they start reproducing again? How many pups do they have? And again... We don't have a lot of this information. So a lot of the time it's not just as Charlene was giving us some really good examples. Not all sharks are created equal. Some are able to re reproduce very, very quickly and some aren't. So we can't compare the number of animals we find at one time of two very different shark species. So all of this is factored into the models and that's why we use generation lengths. So it has to be over three generation lengths. And this also can be a problem when we've got lots of very recent data that is not showing us anything. So if we're seeing a very dramatic drop in a couple of years, unfortunately we're not allowed to use that because it's not enough time for us to make an accurate assessment. So we can flag things and say, we found this really scary trend, we need to go back and visit this. But it's just something to keep in mind. And then again, the geographic range, which is very applicable to a lot of our endemic species. Um, I'm interested to see, now that we're doing the global reassessments, how they come out, because we actually have a lot that fit into criteria B, ooh, <laughs> criteria B, which is the restricted geographic range. And that's not very common for a lot of sharks and rays. So that means they're in a really small area which puts them at risk of extinction. So I was saying the other day, if something comes along like an environmental shift or something and can wipe them out. So again, 
These are the threatened categories, critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. And again, they fit into, again on that sheet if you're interested, or you can look it up on the website. Um, it's very specific amounts over time, so a reduction of 80% over this amount of time. And just quickly, if you do go on, you can see for every single species, it actually will tell you like vulnerable B2, so you can figure out why it's assessed as that, which I find really interesting. Again, being a bit of a criteria nerd. <laughs> So at the moment, um, our UCN shark group is assessing all the sharks and rays around the world. Most assessments go out of date. Um, they are meant to be done every 10 years uh, to see if we can evaluate changes over time. And then we can apply these at international, national, and very local scales. Um, it's also got very stringent, um, which I've kind of had a bit of <laughs> hard time battling with the last few weeks. Um, so as Charlene said, some of it was the way that it used to be done was one person would go off and do it and then it was kind of agreed, whereas this time we all sat in a room and debated things out. There's a lot of the previous assessments that were done incorrectly, or there are things that would have been passed in, uh, passed in the past um, that aren't acceptable anymore. Like, for example, some of the ones that I've been talking about uh, say things like pollution is a threat, we're going to make a statement like that, we have to provide hard evidence, so we're having to cut it out. Um, so it's really interesting. It's a lot more stringent than it was in the past. Um, just quickly, they're doing it everywhere around the world. The first one was sub-equatorial uh, sub Africa, which is our region. Um, and the reason that is, is because we were the highest priority, again, based on those threatened endemic species in that map. I don't know if you remember that I showed you the other day. We have the highest concentration, along with Brazil. So we were targeted as the first two workshops to um, undertake as part of the global assessment. And ours will be the first paper coming out, which is very exciting, out of all the global assessments of sharks and rays. So what we do is just quickly gather all the data, and this can be a bunch of different things. Um, so fisheries data, whether there's anecdotal evidence, not great, but when we're in, talking in countries like Kenya and Madagascar and Mozambique, um, literally it will be, we, if we have any data, it'll be all sharks and rays, 200 species, lumped into one and over time. So it's very, very difficult. So we have to work with what we can. Of course, we all want good data, but we have to recognize that a lot of places can't collect that data. So we try to go through what we can. We've <laughs> quite a lengthy process again, just trawling through every bit of scientific literature. We had a lot of uh, fisheries managers private data that we're not allowed to share with anyone, which is very different to um, reporting as well, which is quite terrifying. Um, but we go through all sorts of different things to try and, try and uh, assess the conservation status. Then we get to a workshop, we all it out. Uh, it goes off here, which is done. We've had quite a few come back and um, been discussion about, and then it goes to the IUCN for final review. And as I said, we have to we have to actually attach any evidence, particularly for species that change, and particularly for threatened species. We have to provide evidence of why we're making them threatened or not. And then finally, it gets published on the red list. I don't have much time to go through all of this, so excuse me skipping through quickly. But just quickly, it's from we've just reassessed from all the way from Namibia all the way up to. Um, the Kenyan border here, and all the islands in the Western Indian Ocean region. There's a group of experts. Um, so quickly, how do we, do, how do we assess it? Um, one thing that's particularly come up this round is rarity is not enough, and declines are not enough. Um, so as I said, this is my little buddy, the Natal Shai shark that I've been defending for the past couple of weeks. Um, however, we can't, because we, there's only been one record of it, that's not enough. We need to prove that it's still ongoing threats and there's ongoing declines. Um, and a lot of the things that were put in before, as I said, habitat destruction and pollution also aren't acceptable anymore. So I'm having to prove that where there might be fisheries, what other interactions there are, again, really having to defend some of these species. And just a couple of other ways we can measure baited water, underwater videos. We use these a lot. Um, again, this is something that's really taking off in South Africa, and it's great. This is by our friend Lauren DeVos here in Falls Bay, but it can help us see trends over time. Uh, we can count how many fish we 
be underwater. And then we can also count that over time or also identify areas where we have large aggregations of species. Again, my good friend, the wedgefish, this is one of the terrifying ones that I've been working on again this week, um, but we've seen massive declines in these animals. Um, but then we also have massive issues of taxonomy of these animals, which is something that um, some of us are gonna be working on for the next couple of years in the Western Indian Ocean region. But this one was flagged as early as the 1990s in um, the Kuzulu Natal shark data that there would be declines. And it's definitely been ongoing, and we've been in all sorts of countries all throughout the Western Indian Ocean, we're seeing the same thing. And these guys actually have more valuable fins than any of the sharks as well. Um, and they're also on the new. Uh, they're also up for CITES appendix listing as well, which is going to have huge ramifications in the Western Indian Ocean. Diver declines as well. This guy used to be really frequent. Um, and then some fishermen went out in Mozambique. Um, again, that was, this was based on a scientific research station. They don't see them anymore. It's quite sad. <laughs> Um, as Charlene said, this is a really emerging one, and I think it's really important to start monitoring in South Africa. So there has been some changes in some of the shark and uh, shark composition, and this has been seen in many, many other species, but I think it's something that's worth looking into for the future. So what we've seen, I guess we've lost the term Global warming, it's more climate change because there's expansion of the warmer water down here. But what seems to be the more, in South Africa, the more interesting one is the cool water coming down. And so all these ones in the middle here are also getting pushed out. Again, just going very quickly through this, but there's been changes in kelp and mussels. And this can affect egg development, growth, where the sharks lay the eggs other than just the effect on the sharks themselves. So it's definitely something to work, look into for the future. And there's a little shy shark sitting in the kelp. Um, again, good habitat, major changes already documented in its, um, in its habitat. So interesting to see how this is gonna change distribution. And we've certainly seen some evidence of some differences in different areas as well. Um, See, it didn't come out right. Uh, so what you can see here, this is just a, a retrospective analysis. So what we're trying to do is track changes over time. Apologies, this didn't come out right, but you can see the dots anyway. So what we're trying to see is we compare all of the categories of all the red list species from 1980 to 2000, which was when the last assessment was done, to 2020, we're calling it 2020. And you can see, unfortunately, there's been a decline in the conservation status of our endemic species. There has been some improvements, and it's good to highlight as well, the ones that have improved in status are the ones that have had the management in place for those ones. So it just shows you if we get it in time, we can actually see an increase in populations, which is why it's really good to monitor these over time. Um, just, yeah, keep an eye out because we're going to be having, we're going to publish our paper hopefully sometime this year. Um, we're definitely really, uh, there's also like lots of ways that you guys can help too. As I said, I rushed through that slide, but there's all these evidence of people taking photos of rocky reefs and kelp forests and mussels. And as Alison was saying, like eggs in uh, rock and stuff like that like you guys can actually contribute to things like this too so if you are interested please take photos there are great apps like um, iSpot I stalk it all the time one of my pictures was in there too uh, in my presentation of sharks left on the beach that's also something that's really important for us to document where's that happening and why um, so I just really encourage you to take photos talk to people um, I hear so many interesting stories I'm still really interested in that sand shark story the other day of sand sharks being left on the side. Um, so yeah, please chat and please, as Alison said, celebrate all the beautiful biodiversity we have here. Work in one of, live and work in one of the most special places in the world. And thank you so much for all your interest.